Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington Russell, Australian award winning author of contemporary romance and kick butt heroines in dark fantasy worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking to a New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal best selling author with over 1.5 million copies sold, as well as a passion flicks adaption. Known for books such as Driven and Everyday Hero series, we are talking to the one and only Kay Bromberg. How are you today? Hello. Good. I am good. And you? Oh, I'm fabulous. Better now that you're on. I am so excited to interview you because you have been a pillar in the publishing industry for a while now. And it's really spectacular to see how shiny your success looks on an outside perspective. But as we know, success is defined differently for everyone. And I want to hear about the highs and lows of your journey and where you started. So why did you start writing and how was publishing for the first time? Um, I had three kids under the age of five and I was going kind of stir crazy. Um, 50 shades of gray came out and my mom had said, called me up. It's like, you need to read this series. You need to read the series, you know, like get into it, Christy. Um, you can do something at nighttime. So I was reading that. And, um, then I started reading Jodi Ellen Malpas and, um, Rain Miller. And I was like, I think I can do this. And so then I thought up Driven and um, my husband was like, go ahead and write it. And so I didn't know, I, I mean, I didn't even tell anyone I was publishing. I just released it and was like, we'll see what happens. So, yeah. Wow. And that was independently published, I'm assuming, yes. in what year? Uh, 2013. So it's been 10 years this year. Congratulations. Thank you. So when did then the snowball effect happen for you? When did you hit that reality where you thought, oh, I'm actually an author. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I released the first one and being a naive new author, I thought, oh, well, well that, at, back 10 years ago, this was a fast pace. It released in every three months is, it was a really fast. Now it's like every month. Um, and so I had released in May and then I said I was going to release in August the second book. And the second book did well. And then the third book kind of went out of control. And then it was like, oh, and then um, I had some publishers interested in some things. And so then it was like, okay, I think I need to quit my day job because I can't do all of these things at once. So, so yeah, so it was probably a year into it. And I was like, okay, I think I can do this. That's incredible. And how did you go jumping into, you know, obviously having offers from publishers, it can be quite intimidating for a lot of us because we don't necessarily have the skill set initially to deal with that so did you make mistakes did you oh, I make huge mistakes <laughs> well I mean for instance with fueled my second book I didn't know I had to register my ISBN numbers so I never registered them so I would have hit New York Times them with that book um and to this day, that's the one book that's never hit any list, which is kind of funny to me. But I um, remember my agent had called because I had an agent by that time. And she called me. She's like, your numbers, like you are going to hit high. Like, like we're waiting, we're waiting for the list. And the list came out. And then it was like crickets. And she's like, can you go into your ISBN dashboard? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, is the dot red or is it green? And I'm like, oh, crap, it's red. But at that point, I had never even considered that an option. Like, you know, I was just writing to write. So um, that was like my first like, okay, you really screwed up there. Um, and then I made sure for the third one that I had it set. Um, but I, it was an interesting journey for me because at that time, everyone had trilogies back then. And I had several friends, like people I had mentioned before, who had sold their trilogies and they'd sold the first two books and then the publisher published the third book. And at that point, um, we had talked about selling it. And at one point my agent came back to me, my agent at that time, and she was like, you know, I don't think we should sell it. I think we should keep it. And then maybe sell like spinoffs for it. Um, to this day, I still question like what I've hit number one if I had sold, cause I hit number two with, with the third book on New York Times. Um, I question if I would have sold it, if I would have hit number one, but 10 years later, I mean, all that income is still mine. So for me, I think it was the right decision and I still, I mean, I still have ownership over it, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and most, cause most people from that time frame don't have ownership over their original series. Um, but yeah, I made a lot of mistakes. I ended up taking, I had some really good deal offers and I ended up taking the smallest deal that was offered because I was terrified I wasn't going to earn out and I was going to like look bad. Um, so I sold three spinoffs 
to um, Penguin Books from that series and I was like, let's take the smallest deal of the ones that are offered. Because like I said, I was new. I didn't want to you know, over promise and under deliver. And what if this was a fluke? And, you know, yeah. you question everything and you, you're your own worst critic. So, um, I mean, looking back at it, did I make the right decision? I, I have no idea. I mean, I'm still here, so we'll say yes. But yeah, that it was very it was very hard, confusing, overwhelming time. And would you say now that because you know a lot of a lot of authors suffer from imposter syndrome or lack Always. of confidence, and do you still have that happen to you even today, right. years later? Everyone does. Yeah, I mean, I look, I we were at Book Bonanza of what a couple months ago, and it's interesting to me. Like, I had several people walk up to me that were like, I started writing because of you and you were, you know, and to me it was, it wasn't that that got me. It was the, you were so nice to me when I asked questions because there were several authors that I reached out to that are now my friends. But at the time I reached out to them and I asked questions and they were like, yeah, good luck. And just kind of like blew me off. So I made it a point to never be that way because I'm, it was very, it's very confusing and there's so much information being thrown at you and there's, so much outside noise that you don't know and there's seven different avenues you can take so you don't know what you're doing is right or wrong and you're always questioning and you're doubting yourself um and so for me that was the coolest thing was having these people come up to me and we're like you know thank you so much and then now I look at them and I'm like oh I'm jealous of you you're doing better than you you know like it's it's so you you always have imposter syndrome and you're always questioning am I doing enough am I doing too little and I mean, once you figure it out, the next the next week, the whole industry changes. So, I mean, it's a constant learning cycle. You never stop learning. And I imagine you probably had a lot of full circle moments as well, as you were just explaining then, you know, you were the one once asking for help. And probably to this day, you still probably ask friends for help because, as you said, it's constantly changing and adapting. So... I'm curious that in the last decade that you have been writing and publishing, what do you think the thing that you weren't expecting from the industry the most that really caught you off guard? It's a bunch of women. So yeah. it's a lot of cattiness. Um, I mean, but that, I guess that should be something that's expected. Um, I think the people that were my friends when I first started before things got really big, but those are the people that I still talk to. Um, people, I'm, I'm trying to say this politely because I, I don't want it to come off that I'm being bitter because I'm not by any means. But people chase the top of the charts. Authors chase the t authors chase other authors that are in the top of the charts because they feel like if they're being seen with them, they'll get more visibility. So there is a lot of shell game going on behind the scenes, and I don't I don't like that. I'm like a straight shooter. I'm not in high school. I'm not in high school anymore. You know, whatever. I don't know what it's called where you where <laughs> where you are. Um, but I don't. That's the stuff that I don't like. I just want to write, and I want to be able to talk to readers. And I don't like the the other stuff behind the scenes. It's just kind of like it's the cattiness. I don't like that. But at the same token, there are so many people in this industry that um, readers and authors alike, and you know, formatters and cover designers and all of that that really make this a positive, cool experience. I mean, I've got to be home and watch my kids grow up because of this job. So for me, that's a really cool thing, you know? I am glad that you raised this though, because in no way do I think it's bitter, but I think it definitely does shed a light on, you know, we always talk about in here, finding our tribe and finding our right people. And I think especially when you have been doing it as long as you have for 10 years as well, you do quickly find the people that you want to keep close and then just keep them close. Those who are honest with you in opinion and are there to support you 100%. Um, so I'm glad you really brought that to light. So yeah, thank and, you. and that tribe has changed over the years because those people have changed too. And so many people that I started with that weren't in the industry jumped in and are now authors. So um, it's, yeah, it's it's just a, the dichotomy changes every couple of years. I mean, and for the most part, I used to be one of people, I was always online. I was always, you know, trying to interact. And then it became like, okay, for me, I need to pull back and I need to focus on what got me here. And the social stuff, you know, the social media stuff is like, okay, it's there, I need it, but it's not the bread and butter for me. You know, it's like the writing is, so that's what I need to focus on. How do you deal with 
social media then because exactly as you said that social media burnout is a real thing um so i'm curious as to how you deal with it especially when there's a lot more pressure nowadays regarding tiktok and just trying to remain relevant so how do you deal um deal with that making sure that you're writing more than you are on social media yeah it is it's social media has changed so much and you know it used to be if you had a facebook page you were like good and now it is TikTok, and you know I feel like oh my god I feel like this old lady trying to like do TikToks. Um, I do have my daughter do some of them for me to help because she's younger and she can handle it. Um, it what what takes her five minutes takes me about an hour and a half. So um, I do I do try and utilize that. But for me, you know, people are so inundated with social media. I figure I need to put out the best product I can. And that should, that should speak for itself, but it's also, you know, the people that have the spiffy marketing and the perfect branding. And honestly, I've never had that kind of branding. I mean, I started out, it was checkered flags and red and black. And then I was like, I never want to see that again because I'm so sick of seeing it. And now 10 years later, I'm back to it with this new racing series. So, um, I'm kind of all over the place. I don't have this cohesive brand, but for me, that's what's worked because I don't like to write the same thing over and over. So, um, social media is it's a blessing and a curse you have to have it because how else are people going to know about it um and to me i like interacting with readers i like hearing their thoughts and their opinions um it's like that too is a blessing and a curse because then it gets in your head and you're writing and you're like oh wait but i know this subset of readers isn't going to like that and i know this subset if i do that this you know so it's you kind of have to just shut the noise out at some point and just write. Tell me then about the new release. What has given you inspiration behind that? And for those who haven't yet read it, tell us what it's about. Um, so my new release is called Off the Grid. I'm going back to racing after 10 years. Um, my agent has been bugging me for years to go back into racing and I shied away from it for a long time because, you know, I was only known as the racing author. <laughs> and so I wanted to prove that I could do other things. But um, Formula One is hot right now. And I figured it's perfect time to go back and dip my toes in that world. Um, so this series is about four different drivers, all on different teams. Um, and so they're, they're standalones. You'll see some of the other drivers in each book, but each book is dedicated to one driver and his love interest. And I'm excited for everyone to get their hands on it. Um, it, it was, it's, it's been exciting to write. I have the first one that's releasing this week and I'm finishing the other one next week and and them all plotted out. So we're, we're good to go. That's so exciting. Am I, are you slightly intimidated to go back into that scene? No, um, because I think someone asked me this question earlier today about what I, you know, what's the difference between driven and now? And I think, I think a good story is always a good story, but I think the writing over 10 years has improved. And so, um, you know, I would, the question was, would I ever go back and change driv the Driven series and update it? And, you know, I told them no, because I wrote that without any pressure and any, but anybody's voices in my ears or any critic, you know, critiques, you know, making me question things. So I would never change that, but the writing definitely has improved in 10 years. So I'm excited to have, you know, a cleaner cut narrative and, um, more motion pulled out of it and just I mean I know I'm more secure in my writing and myself now so I think it's it, it comes through. Do you have a um, passion for the sport as well yourself personally? Um, yeah I like I, I like I like all sports I write a lot of sports romance I, it's fun to me but yeah I follow Formula One yeah. Yeah how do you go then this is I always find any type of sports romance really unique because I question as to how much of the jargon and how much you really focus on what the rules are or is it more so the relationship that you focus on and the additives i always focus on to me sports there's a specific type of hero with sports you know there's a, a cockiness a swagger um it's always better if they're tortured in some way you know just that type of thing um the sports has to be a part of it but it's not the story but I know writing it that people, the people who love that specific sport are going to pick it apart if it's not right. So um, luckily I follow a lot of sports, so I know it. Um, but, you know, because Formula One is so hot right now, I, I 
was very careful with how I did things because I knew everything had to be very specific. And, you know, even down to the tracks and what locations they are. I mean, it took me like a full day to literally, I had every chapter laid out and I'm like going off the current race schedule for this year going, okay, how are the races laid out? And then I think every year the race schedule changes. So in two years from now, if someone reads it, they're going to be like, well, that's wrong. But I mean, you can only do what you can do. Um, but yeah, specifically this, because it's so popular right now with Drive to Survive on Netflix, everybody thinks they're an expert. Um, and I'm sure I will get some people's feedback saying, oh, you did this wrong. And I'm like, eh, it's creative, creative leisure. You must have to um, grow a thick skin for that as well. Because I know, especially if, uh, say for a first time author, having that and that outside noise, it can get quite crippling. I think if somebody tells you for whatever reason, you've done something wrong, which we get many critiques on because everyone has yes. different opinions and that's okay. What were some of the conversations that you had with yourself to become more confident and just understand that it's okay for people to have different opinions? So I'm, I'm a review reader. So I read every review. Um, I will go for the first, like, you know, couple hundred reviews on Goodreads and I read them good, bad, and ugly. Um, I find that I can learn from them. Um, I feel like the Driven series was made 10 times better because I read reviews from Driven and then I went through and I ripped the entire second book apart and changed it to add his voice because it was all her point of view. So I think the point being, I think that you can read and learn from, as long as they're just not complete a-hole trolls, you know, which there are those. Um, but I do think, you know, one and two star reviews can help you. you. You can learn from that because you can see other points of views and you can see that how other people read things because... I write first person and in first person you're in, you're in the hero and heroine's head depending on which point of view you're writing. And so I've learned a lot of like, well, she's so wishy-washy and I used to get really offended by that. And then I realized she's wishy-washy to you because you're hearing her thoughts. Yeah. And a lot of people go back and forth on things before they truly commit and voice something. So for me, you know, it's okay for a heroine to be wishy-washy only, only if you're hearing her thoughts because then when she says, states what she's going to do, she's already made up her mind. Um, but I used to have really struggled with that. And I used to struggle with people saying there's too much internal monologue. Um, but that's how you set the stage. So I had to, a couple of years ago, I got really, and I got kind of burned out, but it was more, I was questioning everything I was writing because I was reading too much. And then I was like, okay, I have to push it all aside, not, you know, um, not listen anymore. Um, and so like I do, I do go back through now and I, I'll read them, but I, I'm not going to please everybody. Everybody has a different, different tolerances. Everybody has different tropes. They like, everybody has different triggers that they like. And you know, when I started, there were no trigger warnings and now there's trigger warnings on freaking everything. I saw a list today for trigger warnings on the book that's releasing. And I was looking at it going, what? Like, I, I never would have saw that, you know, like I wouldn't think that would be a trigger warning, but I'm not in someone else's shoes. Yeah. So um, you just kind of have to know that you're no one is ever, not you're not going to have a million five star reviews unless like I was looking at I was looking at oh fourth wing the other day and I'm like, Rebecca, like every single review is a four and five star. And I was so excited for it because I'm like, that is impossible to do. FYI, also side note, that's a fantastic book. Have you read it? Oh, I took it. I like held off forever because I was like dragons and then I think I read it like four times in a row yeah so good so good that was a nice little side note so um yeah. yes we understand what the hype is about we love <laughs> what then what is your writing process then you know do you do you have to this like last minute writing <laughs> I mean, yeah the the red hot button going mayday mayday yeah. <laughs> um I used to be a very detailed outliner like I had to have a separate don't judge. I just have to handwrite my outline and I just have to have a separate handwritten page for every chapter. And I had this whole setup and it was like, so I had an extra sheet of paper, like I would handwrite it. And then I would have for, you know, as I'm writing to add things or to take things out. But then that was just more of the process to get it in my head. Because then once I had it, i never went to my notes ever. Like it was just kind of in your head, like the handwriting process. Um, and then the pace of writing got, you know, picked up. People were writing books every month and I'm just sitting there going, uh, I can't do this, but I had to quicken my process up some. Um, so now I pretty much have an idea. I have a rough outline. It's nowhere near the 80 pages it used to be. Um, 
and then I go with it. But if I don't have some kind of rough outline, I spin my wheels for like weeks. Um, and I've also learned that if I wait till about 20 days till deadline, I write much faster and much quicker. <laughs> My stress levels increase every time you say that. Yeah. But it works for some people. Someone told me, um, Becca Sign was like, you're like a phoenix. Like, you know it has to happen. You burn through it. And then you crash for like two months. And it's kind of true. Like, everything gets pushed aside. And then I take, you know, a week. You know, I say I'm going to take a week to catch up. And then a week turns to a month. And then, oh, crap, another deadline. It's funny because I'm a Phoenix writer, so I understand this. But being a Phoenix writer as well, how do you go with the consequence of possible burnout at the end? It's always there. I mean, there's a couple of years ago I did burn out. Um, it's always there. There's always the, okay, someone, I don't know who it was. Someone told me one time, your first 10 books are gravy. Like you can write them like the back of your hand. There's no questions you just write. And then after that, it gets really hard. And it does because you're like, okay, I've already done a plot like this. I already did a character like this. I already did a subplot like this. And, and you question like, but then you have to, not everyone reads all your books. So that was a hard thing for me to overcome to know like, okay, well, especially going back into racing, I know I'm going to be compared to my first series. My only thought is, hey, what if all these new readers say, oh, wait, she can write racing. Let me go back to the old stuff. So, I mean, you can never win. You just have to kind of go with it. And I, one thing that I find common on here as well, I think um, I've done about 140 episodes now, and one consistency that I find across the board, across the board, should I say, is, you know, those first year or two, everyone's like, I wrote so much. And it's almost obsessive because I find the words just spill off the page. And then I think as soon as you get to about that two-year, maybe three-year mark, everything catches up and everything slows down because initially we don't know some of the sacrifices we might be making on our body or whatever it may be to like yeah. keep that pace because we're so obsessed and so excited. And then we get to a point where we think, oh, this is a business. I need to learn all these other things because a yeah. lot of us don't have a budget initially to be able to outsource. So then it kind of just keeps throwing it's, more and more on. It's 30% writing. It's 70% everything else. And I also think, um, I mean, and this is not, this does not, I don't want this to come off as a poor me. Um, but I started this back on the tail end of 50 shades when it wasn't an inundated market. And so now those of us who did that, you know, we're working and we're releasing probably four times the amount of what we used to, to make the same income. So it, there is a threat of burnout in all of us. And, you know, and I see a lot of friends go through it and it's like, okay, how do I not do that? How do I not become that? And you know, you're going to, and you know, I mean, like right now, like I was telling you before we started filming, like I'm at the point in this whip that I'm writing right now, like I skip the sex scenes. Like sex scenes are the hardest thing for me to write. They take the longest amount of time. And I have such, I have a working relationship with my editor. She knows I can write the sex scenes after, you know, 38 books, she knows. So I just write, insert whatever kind of sex scene it's gonna be, you know, slow, hate fuck, whatever. And then um, she knows I'm going to come back to it. So it does make the book harder because you can't, you know, that adds an, an element to it when you're writing these characters. But I mean, sometimes you just have to do what you have to do to get it to get it to the editor. And yeah. then you can be like, OK, what else can I add in to make it better and then adjust? And that's understanding and coming to terms with your process because our process has changed over time. As you said, when you were initially writing handwriting to now, when you just know, no, I know I'll come back to it. I know I can feel it. Yeah. Sex is inserted here. Um, and I think that does take some people a while to have confidence in that process as well. And it's okay if it doesn't look like somebody else's. I'm somewhat curious if you've ever struggled with comparison-itis. With other authors? Yeah. Always. Yeah. Always. Um, I think that's part of the reason I don't read much anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to read, you know, my friend's stuff and I'd be like, oh my God, like how, you know, and then the next time you're writing, you start thinking, oh, but that scene was so good. And if, how do I tweak it? And so I never want to be compared that I'm doing that. Like for instance, you know, I'm writing Formula One and everyone has told me I need to read Lauren Asher's Dirty Air series and I really want to read it, but I knew I was writing the series. And so I purposely have stayed away from it because any comparison that's going to be made or if, if I, what if I have the same tropes or a same similar situation, I want to be like, Hey, I haven't read them. Like you can check my Kindle guys, you know, like I promise I haven't read them. Um, 
but there's always going to be the same scenes. I mean, there's only so many ways and so many scenes you can write romance. And I'm making sure my kids aren't. And oh, so many ways you're going to have sex. Like, how many scenes, you know, you have three or four scenes of, like, detailed scenes of book. And then you have some more fade to black. Like, come on. It only can go so many places. Uh, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, told you I tell it like it is. So, I mean, at some point, it, it, it's kind of like you, you feel repetitious. You worry that. You know, how are, you know, the, the top books on Amazon, hey, what are their sex scenes like? Because, you know, what are, what are they doing that I'm not? Um, and so that's always, you're always questioning and comparing and impostering and going, okay, why are they successful? Why am not? Why, why am I not? You know, I'm checking their marketing. I'm checking their giveaways. I'm checking their newsletters. And you're like, you know what, at some point, okay, let me just stay in my lane mm -hmm. and hope that that takes care of it. What are the things I'm curious then that that do in a way bring you back down and think actually I am still badass though like are there certain achievements that you think of or sentimental moments that you think back on with readers what what brings you back and makes you remember you're a badass I'm still here after 10 years like I have seen so many friends come and go, um, people that I started out with, you know, and every once in a while someone will be like, what happened to so-and-so? And you're kind of just kind of like, oh, because you want them to still be here. Um, I think I'm still here. Like I have never taken a writing class in my entire life. I just write what I like, used to like to read. And not that I don't like to read it now, but I just don't read. Um, and I was able to do all this from that to me. To me, that's pretty cool. Um, there are certain readers that I still see, you know, nine years later that there are certain books I've written that have touched them. Um, the Driven series had some heavy topics in it um, about abuse. And I have one reader whose husband, she put in jail because she saw, like, she read the book, she started seeing things with her kids. And it was like, oh, I hope so stuff like that is just, you never expect that kind of thing when you write. Um, and then I have a really cool group on Facebook with people that have been in there for 10 years. And so, I mean, we've watched babies, we've watched marriages and we've watched spouses die. And they all, st like one of them's having surgery this week and there's a big group text, okay, who's doing flowers? And it's like, how cool is that? That, you know, that they've stayed connected and we're still connected all this year only simply because of a book. So that's cool to me. That's my full circle. Well, you mentioned Becca Syme, who I love. She is the best. So I'm assuming you have done perhaps her course maybe. Is that correct? Yes, but I'm really bad at that. Like you asked me what to name my things are and I'm just like, I realized I can never go back to school. Like it was a great course and everything she said was right about me. But I'm like, you asked me what I, I'm just like, okay, sure. I think I'm input. I know I'm something else. Like, I know yeah. there's a lot to five. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, actually, um, what resources or what um, connections really helped you in your writing career that were really, or whether it's podcasts you listen to or YouTube, whatever it may be, was there certain resources that really helped you um, phenomenally in your career? This is, this is an interesting question because I did a, a talk with RWA a couple, I think earlier this year, and I was on it with like five other authors and they are talking about all of these courses and these classes. And then it came to me and I was like, yeah, I haven't taken any. <laughs> um, and I haven't. Um, I'm a very, like, I like to research things on my own. I haven't taken any writing classes. I haven't taken really any craft classes. And when I do sign up for them and pay for them, then I really don't finish them. Um, I've taken ad classes. Poor Sky Warren probably hates me because I sign up for every ad class and then I just don't finish it because I just don't have, like, I'm like, really? Like, I, I can't process this, uh, which is really weird because I was a really good student. Like, I was top of my class type student. And now it's like, I just, I, I, my brain just doesn't want to do it. Um, I have looked at people's different plotting, the W's, the V's, the arcs, the circles. I just, it doesn't work for me. So I just kind of do my own thing. So yeah, I don't have, I haven't taken classes. I haven't done anything. I love that though, because not everyone is going to be doing classes. So yeah. I love too that it just reiterates that you don't have to do all the courses or you don't have to, because I think some people can also do too, too much. much. Yeah. Like if you still need it's to be mechanical, it becomes mechanical. Yeah. 
Yes, 100% I agree with that. So what advice would you have when it comes to, say, new authors or even authors who have been in this industry for a couple of years, especially with how it's changed, um, regarding contracts, publishers, agents? Like, it's a big beast out there. So what would your first bits of advice be if they are trying to stretch out from the indie publishing world? Yeah, and it's changed so much. It used to be a publishing contract was all you wanted. And now people just shy away from them. Um, but there's still that, hey, I, you know, I want to see my book on a bookshelf. You know, I want to walk into Walmart or Target and be like, oh, my, my advice is I don't like all my eggs in one basket. Um, I did. I have. Sorry, I'm going to look up at my books. I think I have 38 books. I have four with Penguin. I have two with Mon Lake. All the rest are my own. But I did just sign a three book deal for an old school trilogy. Um, I, I like, I've learned something different from each process. I learned, I learned a ton from my editor at Penguin when I, when I went, was with them when I was first starting out. And I think that was, has been invaluable to this day. Um, you know, I did the Montlake thing. I did an audible first with audio. Um, and then I decided, you know what, I want to go back, like, let me just try it again and see what, what it's like. Um, I think you need to be open to everything. I think you not, ne don't need to say I'm only going to be an indie author I'm, because the dynamic changes constantly, you know, as we all know right now with Kindle Unlimited, you know, the pre the payout's gone low and people are, are kind of freaking out and jumping ship. Um, everything in this industry is a cycle. It's like a three month cycle. You think you got it and you're up here and you're like, sweet, I have it figured out. And then it goes like this and you're like, you, you feel lost again. Um, I think, I think you need to listen if you have an agent to your agent, but you also need to listen to other authors. Um, I had numerous people calling me when we were doing the whole, should I sell driven? Should I sell spinoffs? Numerous people, some people told me, don't ever do it. You're going to ruin your life because they had been sued by their publishers. I have other people who were like, it's the best thing I've ever done. So it's the imposter syndrome thing. You need to look at your own lane. You need to take the input in from everybody else around you. And you need to be very cognizant of the charts, of what's selling of how you are as a business person. Do you like to give your control to somebody else? Do you want to retain your control? If you give your control to, an, to a publisher, in between, how can you publish your indie books? Because that's where you're gonna make your money in the meantime. You know, advances right now, we used to go from advances being 200,000 to being 25,000. So, you know, you can't live on 25,000 a year unless you eat ramen, I guess, every day, but still not. So. You know, like it was a big deal with with this deal I just signed. It was like, okay, we're going to release them one a year, but what's the time period before and after that release date that I can publish my indie books? And I'm gonna and I'm gonna publish one right on that deadline, before and after, because that will allow me to have three books in like a five month period. Because um, that is some things that that if you have a newer agent or you're you're not savvy enough, you are going to be so eager to sign a deal that you're not going to think about, oh, wait, they pay me half of that when I sign. They pay me half of that when I publish. Oh, and then I have to earn out before I get any money back again. So um, that's those are the things that I think are really like you have to think about. You have to think about, are they do they want the first right of refusal, which means when you write your next book, do they have to see it first and say yes or no? Because I don't want them to see it. You know, what if I, what if I only have one, three books with them because I want to publish that next book indie. Um, I released a series called Re Resist and Reveal that Penguin had offered on and I rejected them and I had to wait so many years to be able to, to publish it myself. So I had to hold on to it for so long. Um, and I mean, we're both, both sides are in it to make money. So you have to look at it as, okay, financially and personally, like, can I hold on? while I'm stuck in this publishing cycle with them and they're like, I'm going to hold on to them as long as I can because they're in a different mindset than we are. India authors are, the more that I publish, the more visible I am, the more people are going to see me and see my books. The, in, the publishing industry is dinosaurs. They don't, they think that, the, that an indie book is going to bring down their traditional book and it's not. 
So it's really important, the terms of your contract, I think. And, and the main part of it is, how is your advance broken down? If you're, if you're taking one, what are your royalties? And more importantly, when can you publish in indie? So, I mean, for me, I know that was a really long response, but it's, it's very things. So many people I've seen do one or the other and then get screwed. So it's like, that's my big, that's my spiel. I love it. I love it. I'm very curious then in your personal opinion, as you said, published in 2013, um, I published in 2014, so almost 10 years. And I find it so interesting to say, yay, I see, I find it so interesting because back then there was so much, um, not embarrassment around being indie published author, but it was very negatively yes. seen initially, especially looked down upon by traditional authors or publishers. And now we've gone into this new this new time where, you know, there's a lot of hybrid authors. People are advocating for indie because they think there's more money to be earned there, whereas traditionally publishing perhaps, you know, as you said, getting onto bookshelves and that. Do you think that... Um, stigma has changed much around the whole indie verse trad or do you think we're still I, I do think it has changed but I also see it maybe swinging back I see book talk has made a huge influence in, but you've also seen all of us changing our covers again and I got it's funny I did like a q and a in my in my Facebook group today and this these two two questions one of them was this question about the covers and you know why are you guys going back to non, you know, ab covers or whatever. And um, I usually do one, both for, for my new, for my new releases, but a lot of it is because we're trying to appeal to the younger generation, which is kind of weird because I don't want my kid reading what I write and she's that age. Um, but it's out there. I mean, they're reading it. Um, I've had more people say, I, I, I want to read this, but I can't cause my mom's going to see the cover. Yeah. And I'm like, Ooh, like as a mom, I'm like, Ew. but, let me change my cover. You know, like that's er, er, Colleen did, you know, wonders for, for book talk. Um, and everybody's chasing that there. I mean, she was lightning in a bottle. I mean, it was lightning in a bottle and no one's going to replicate that, but I still think there are so many authors trying to chase just maybe a tiny fraction of that lightning. Um, so you see everybody trying to adjust and pivot and see, you know, what does book talk want this minute? And then what do they want the next minute? Um, it's exhausting. I mean, it really is exhausting. Um, but I do see, I do see more negativity now because of it, because of book talk. But I also think that's a small subset yeah. of the people that we, that read us. So, um, I don't know. I do see a lot of bloom books has come in and made a lot of changes um, with take, taking up books that have already been released as indie and then taking them as their own. And I mean, they're freaking everywhere and everybody's done really well with them. Um, and then Bramble, which is St. Martin's Press, they just created an imprint called Bramble, which is romance only. That's who I signed my deal with. Um, so everybody's trying to get a cut of the romance market. And I think finally, you know, it used to be said romance pays the bills for the publishing house. They just don't like to say, to say that to anybody. I think now they're saying it to everybody. So it's, it's a good thing. It's just, I'm just not sure where the public lays on that, yeah. lies on that, whatever. That's why I have an editor because I don't know which word to say there, lays, lies, whatever. It's a hard one. It's hard gauging how it has changed, what hasn't changed in some aspects. I love it. I am curious. I want to talk about passion flicks because you had driven adapted to passion flicks, which is super exciting. So I yes. would love to know what that experience was for you and any advice you have to prepare somebody an author's expectation on what to expect in a contract like that. Okay. So here's my take on it. Um, it was cool. I mean, it's surreal. I mean, who doesn't want to see their characters come to life and, get to have and, and the cool thing about passion flicks is you get to have as much or as little input as you want if you don't want anything to do with it give it to them and let them take it if you want something to do with it you can help rewrite the script you can be on set you can you know like i was on set for the first one i think 10 out of the 15 days that we filmed and so you know it'd be like cut and then tosca would look at me she's like are we good with that and i'd be like yeah you know and she'd be like okay no no, no. what don't you like you know so that's what's cool. Um, 
and you know, for me, it was right after the Me Too movement that we made it. So there were a lot of lines that in the book work on film, not so much. And so, and they were some of the most quoted lines like on Goodreads and it was like, uh, do I take them out? And in the end I was like, I would rather have a movie that someone's gonna watch versus cringe and be like, that's so cheesy and then turn it off. Um, it was a very cool experience. I think that um, there is definite plus and minuses. To me, I looked at it as, I know it's not, you know, Paramount. I know it's not Metro Gold, you know, all the different studios. They were going to take at that time, it was six years old. They were going to take a six year old series and they were going to pay me to market it for me. And that's how I went into it. You know, I didn't expect Tom Cruise. I didn't expect, you know, whoever, you know, I knew that it was, it was going to be streaming. Um, and I just went into it. Like I'm going in for the experience. Um, and whatever happens, happens, but Hey, it's pretty damn cool. Yeah. And I think with expectations like that, you know, you walk in the first day on set and someone walks in as your character and you're just like, holy crap. So, um, and it ended up being a great experience for me. Um, you know, I went in kind of hesitant and just looked at it as like, hey, it's a marketing experience. They're going to help me out, you know, revamp this series. And then it ended up being really cool. And I made really great friends. And I learned so much about writing that you can say so much with so much less because I used to beat my readers over the head with certain things and it's like hey one simple look can cut like three pages out you know so um I I just looked at it as learning you know and opening up to a different experience and it was cool it was I mean how can it not be cool that's so cool <laughs> I love that you had that experience like that and again that must be another full circle moment thinking yeah um, totally ever not, not expected would have never in a million years and then it was like in a matter of literally like two weeks like oh hey um we bought your script like two years ago but we're gonna do it right now and you're like what and then yeah one thing I find very um intriguing about you as well is the amount of guest speaking that you do you're on seminars you're on panels and you you give back a lot and it kind of makes sense to me now as you were saying there were authors that you were asking for help and suggestions at the start but I was wondering did you always have that skill set or was that something that came along and you just grew on book people are my people so I'm comfortable you know like these people read the ins my inside, my thoughts in my head. Like, so for me, you can put me in a room of people and I'm like, yeah, but you put me in, in a book, in a room of book people, I'm good. Like, because we get each other, you know, we're all kind of introverts. We're all kind of extroverts. A lot of us don't want to people, but when we're together, we can talk books. So I, rem I will never forget. I was at a signing in, I think it was London. And they had like this big room of authors and you had to walk in and find your table. And I remember walking in and finding my table and I was nervous as hell. And later that week, um, another author had written like a post about the signing. She said, and I want to walk into a room with confidence like Christy Bromberg. And I'm thinking, if you only knew how terrified I was. But I think that's a perfect metaphor. Like you just have to fake it till you make it. And then you're there and you're comfortable and you're like, hey, these are my people. What would you say your greatest challenge and your greatest accomplishment has been in your writing career? My greatest challenge is every book. <laughs> um, it's the next, it's the next thing. Mm -hmm. How do I make it fresh? How do I make it innovative? How do I make it new? How do I make it not like the 20 other, you know, that are releasing that day? Um, how do I market it? How do I have a new cover? How do I get a model that hasn't been used 20 times? I mean, it's just the cycle. Um, how do you stay at the top of your game when there's a thousand other people just like you? I mean, that's not, that sounds horrible, but it's true. Um, my greatest accomplishment is that I'm still here. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the attrition rate in this industry is insane. So for me to s still be here and still love it, there's days I don't love it, but you know, when I have to write sex scenes like 10 in a row, um, because I skip them when I write the whole book. Um, that is to me that's the coolest thing yeah well, I get well, to do what I love I get to have create be creative and you know have my dogs at my feet while I write <laughs> that's the best part of this let's yeah. do it babies um I have a segment called speed dating with an author okay. so 
candle. I've lit a candle. I've created an ambience. We're on a very romantic date. But basically what it is is five rough questions. Are you ready? Oh, God. Yes. Yep. <laughs> what is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Oh, my God. <laughs> what isn't a clumsy moment I've had? Um. Okay, we have to come back to that one because I don't, I don't know that one. <laughs> I'm going to love this because I feel like all of these questions are going to put you on the spot and I can't wait. Good. <laughs> what are the three words that best describe you? Determined. My kids would say loud. Um, dedicated. I love those. Those are three good ones. What is the song that best describes you? Oh, God. <laughs> Or a band or a singer that you feel like really embodies your soul. I'm trying to think. I'm like, I was just at a Taylor Swift concert. How many crazy songs does she have about being crazy? I'm going to say a Taylor Swift song, but I'm think, trying to think which one. I love it. Let's go with it. What, or should I say who, has been your favourite character to write and why? Can I let you one? <laughs> I'm going to say Colton from Driven, just because he was my first. He taught me how to write like a man, which means you can say and do anything you want without having to think before you speak. Um, and he's who started all this. Yeah, I love that. And last but not least, what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? I'm boring. Um, I can yell at my kids in a very nice voice in public so that no one knows. <laughs> Do you know how many mothers are going to be watching this and thinking, we also have that? I mean, how many of us can, like, scold our kids and, like, have a smile on our face in public and they're just like, hmm, That's really? probably what's really terrifying about it. <laughs> I'm having a good time, really. Did you think of your clumsy moment? Or are you naturally clumsy? I'm usually not, though. That's why I think I'm trying to think of one. Like, I've never fallen on my face in front of anyone. I've never... Oh, Okay. We had to, um, it's going to come out soon anyway. So I recently did a thing where Passion Flicks came in there, followed me around for a day with the camera, which that is uncomfortable as heck for two days. And one of them is we went to the driving range and I've never been to a driving range to golf in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was fun as you're like missing the ball every time you go to hit it <laughs> and you're falling down because you don't know what you're doing. So I will say that's clumsy. I love that. And it's I'm sure there will be some great footage filmed of that. It's recorded even better. <laughs> I have had so much fun today. Thank you so much for coming on. And most importantly, where do we find you and what's coming out? Um, you can find me at kbromberg.com or on Amazon, Kindle Unlimited, you know, all the places, uh, all, all the social media sites because we have to do it. Um, and coming up is I have a release called Off the Grid uh, about a Formula One racer. Which we're very excited. And do you know what the the release schedule is? Did you say every three months you were going to release some of these? <laughs> um, let me look at my thing because I have it all printed out because I'm type A. Um, I have the second one on the edge will be coming out in January. And then Over the Limit, which is the third, is in June. And then August will be Out of Control, which is the fourth one. Because I'm writing that other trilogy in between. So I have to like double write books. Oh my gosh. And did you say before you had a Facebook group? Is that? Um, um, yes. It's just, it's, uh, I think it's called K Bromberger VP Pit Grew. We go by both. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I'll definitely be joining after this. Thank you again for coming on. And who knows, maybe we'll see uh, your progress in the next year. Or so I'll maybe get you back on. Sounds good to me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.